Hey, I'll offer my own welcome to you as well. We're so glad that you're here today. If you're here, first time guest, um, our members know this, but our hope in all of this today is really a singular focus that you'll leave reminded of how much God loves you. That's, that's it. And, uh, you know, not what we do for him, but what he's accomplished for us already. So that's always our prayer in the worship time is just, Lord, remind us again of how much you love me, because then that, right, we respond in worship and we respond with obedience of life, worship as life. And that's our great hope today. So we've been walking through this series. If you've been with us and some of you haven't been, we've been walking through the six trials of Jesus the night before he is crucified. And some are more like hearings, you know, it's not like following our judicial system, but there's different trials. There's six different points along the way. And uh, we've got one more next week. Um, today, we're going to talk about how you are, you're valued. He was devalued so that you might be valued. Some of you have been with us uh, throughout this series, and we've been talking about the fact he was condemned so that we would, would be set free. We would not be condemned. He was, you know, convicted of sin so that we could be found innocent. So the great exchange there, the premise is that certainly he died on the cross for our sin. Um, that's where all of it leads. And we always look at that. The ultimate sacrifice is on the cross, certainly, but he suffered all the way for us as our substitute to, uh, to the cross. And so a lot of people think that Christianity is work harder, get better. And it's not that. It's believe more deeply what has already happened, what Christ has already done. And those are two very different things. One's a work harder, get better religion called Christianity. One is the gospel where you bring nothing to the table. And this is hard for us to get our minds around because we tend to value, you know, what our input or others input, how valuable you are in culture, society. And we're going to talk about that today. Um, but there's a lot of different ways, uh, you know, that people um, value the human life. I was doing a little research this, this week. You may not know this. Um, you are worth $40 million as an individual. Now, this is a statistical life, but think about this. Um, if you, I know this is dark. If you were to harvest your organs and your body parts, you'd be worth $40 million. Now, you'd be dead, but you'd be, that, you're worth a lot. That's a lot. Um, now, the federal government does this all the time. I, I discovered this makes sense. When you do a cost-benefit analysis, uh, federal agencies, you know, think about it. Like during pandemic, the cost-benefit, if we do this and it's going to cost this much federal money, how many lives might it save? If it's going to save one, two million dollars, I mean, million people, how much is that worth? And the, the, the federal government says that you're worth $10 million. So a little less than... You're actually, you know, donating yourself or giving yourself away. Um, and yet again, some of you are like, I've paid $10 million in taxes, so I'm getting nothing back right now. Um, but but the, the, the point is this. We know you can't put a value on a human life, right? You can't, or can you? And yet we do it all the time. We put price tags on people all the time based on, watch this, subconsciously, the moment we meet people. Color of the skin, what they're wearing, what they look like. People get to know where they live, what's your position. People at work, oh, you're in that, you know, you're on that team. You're in that, you know, that department. I'm, I'm, up, I'm here. You're down here. We do it all the time. And maybe worse of, worse, the worst thing of all is that we often, uh, yeah, we all do it. We look at ourselves that way, right? Either feel devalued or I'm, I'm, I'm pretty amazing because of certain things in our lives. Today, we're going to see that most often we do this. We place our value on the position, some position we have in life, whether that's vocational or otherwise, um, or our performance in some certain area of our life, right? Or even in our plans, our own dreams and hopes and plans, our agendas become our idols, if you will, where we find our great worth and value. We're going to unpack that today as we look at this incredible passage you're going to find in chapter 23 of Luke, Luke 23. Now, for those of you who are reading along with us, um, and I hope everybody, you know, whether you're a member or not, but all members, this is what we're doing as a church family. We're walking through, I'm holding up a bookmark that has all of the, the scriptures we're reading. You can dive in at any time. Grab one of these on your way out. It's also online. Um, but we are in the book of Luke, in fact, and you're going to see this next week, actually Easter week, only two weeks away, by the way. Um, we're going to be reading out of Luke 23, and you're really going to be diving into those last, gosh, Passion Week um, of Jesus. We've noted that about a third of the Gospels, um, gosh, even more than that, are actually uh, just the final week of his life. So that, 
That tells you a lot about how important this is. So uh, let's jump in. Let me put it in context before we go. We're getting to the th- uh, second of three civil trials. We have the religious trials. Now they're, they, they realize, right, that only Rome can put him to death. Only Rome can issue the capital punishment um, you know, uh, verdict. And so uh, now he's before Rome. Now it's shifted because we, oh, we think we've got something on him now. And it's primarily not so much blasphemy because they don't really care. Rome doesn't so much um, as much as the Jews. So now they're, they're thinking, oh, he's, he's claimed to be a king. Now we got something. Now, so they shift him over to Pilate. And um, he has been, now keep this in mind. He has, by this point, he has been beaten severely. He's been up all night. He has been punched in the face over and over again. He's likely in chains. And we, we think of him just standing there if you've watched movies or whatever else. Um, he's likely on the floor. And this is the picture now. They're dragging him everywhere that he goes. He's already exhausted, beaten severely. And these religious and civil leaders have completely devalued Jesus. Because, we've talked about this, they think they're familiar with him, think they know what he's about. And we can do the same. Familiarity leads to an unfamiliarity. Unfamiliarity leads to contempt, literally in this passage, the word, which means to discredit, to devalue, to look down on someone instead of who they really are. They have completely now uh, devalued Jesus, looking at him, treating him with contempt, and their contempt has led them to profound ignorance. But this can even happen among believers who we think, I've got him figured out. And today, I hope that you're going to be challenged in all of this um, because we find an incredible passage uh, where God's going to show us again how much he loves us. The first thing I want you to see is that you're worth more uh, than your position, okay? You're worth more than your position. Look at this, verse 6. It says, when Pilate heard this, so what is this? Verse 5, just jump up to verse 5. The people had, had just said to him, they've just said to him, hey, he's been causing a stir throughout the region, uh, here, there, and in Galilee. So Herod hears that, I mean, Pilate hears that, so that's why he, said, he asked whether he's a Galilean. So wait, 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 you're a Galilean? And, he, you know, he, the, and by the way, Jesus is silent throughout this whole passage. Watch this. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem, right there, pretty much close proximity, just right, uh, right beside one another, essentially. Uh, we've noted that Pilate and Herod are both in Jerusalem now because this is Passover, Uh, Some scholars think there's a million, two million perhaps people who've descended, ascended into Jerusalem, and that's why they're there. People of authority, in case something goes down, there's certain trials that are being taken place. There's some some, uh, traditions, uh, even in the judicial system that take place, as we see with Barabbas. It's why they're there, okay? They'd rather be over in um, Caesarea Martima on on the coast of, um, of the Mediterranean, where Pilate lived, and then Herod lived in Tiberias, which we went by through on our Holy Land trip in the fall on the west side, west, if you know the, the area at all, west, southwest side of, um, of the Sea of Galilee. So some history is important. Okay, so hang with me for just a sec. You history geeks can, can kind of get all into this, but this is not Herod the Great. Um, this is Herod Antipas. Okay, Herod the Great's the one who died right about the time that Jesus was born. He's the one who issued the, um, the massacre of the innocents, we call it, the massacre of the babies when Jesus was born. He died soon after that. This is, Herod the Great is quite a, quite a character. He had 12 sons. Um, and, and so he had, this one was given, his given name was Antipas, all right? And, and Herod the Great died and he willed over his whole region to, uh, you've heard the word tetrarch. He's called a tetrarch, um, tetra, okay, so four. It's a quarter, quarter of the region um, half of it actually was given to Herod's uh, Antipas' brother, Archelaus. He ends up with half of it. Uh, Philip, a, another half-brother, and Herod Antipas. Okay, get the other two, two quarters, if you will. Over time, okay, um, Archelaus is fired. Pilate takes on over a succession of procurators, um, more than you need to know. But Pilate takes over this, this lower half of uh, half of the half of the empire, but he's got the upper hand on Antipas because he is reporting to Rome directly, right? And so consider, here's why I'm saying all this. Consider this. This is the Herod that executed Jesus' beloved 
cousin, right about the same age as Jesus. They would have grown up, right, together, essentially. His loved, beloved uh, cousin is beheaded by this Herod. Keep this in mind, because I think it comes into play. Because he had the courage to speak truth to power. And he said, to, he, he's not, not, he wasn't rebellious. He, you know, he wasn't causing some insurrection. He said, you know what? Being married to your brother's sister is jacked up. In fact, Leviticus 18, 20 speaks of that. It's wrong. And he calls him out. And Herod, because he finds, here it is, he finds his worth and identity in his position. Anytime someone comes at you in your position, making you, you know, threatening you, essentially, not what John's seeking to do, but he's saying, this is wrong. Herod in his insecurity feels threatened, Antipas. And so he has, he doesn't want to be, you know, embarrassed in front of all of his guests, all of his friends. He has him beheaded and, and, and taken out. And you may know this. Jesus becomes a threat to anyone in power who seeks to use their power to oppress others. Anybody who takes a position and, and then uses it up against others, like anyone who finds their worth in their position. Now, Pilate and Herod will do anything to protect their position and reputation. We're prone to do the same. This is why they're playing politics with each other. Um, they're essentially on the same you know, place in the org chart. But again, Pilate's got the upper hand as he, they're both trying to, striving to outdo each other. Um, in the eyes of Rome, okay? So with that background, it plays into this where many of us, I think, place our value in our position as well. I want you to think about that for a moment. Um, because the only way that, that you really can understand this truly, to understand your position is by comparison, right? Comparing yourself to others. And I think we do this subconsciously. We do it very clearly often. And, and comparison becomes competition, like, where, where do I stand in the org chart, if you will, in this organization? And not just vocationally. Maybe where you stand in, in your family or some of our young people. Well, I'm a starter, you know. I'm, I'm, I, well, well, I, and then it goes the other way. I sit on the bench. I'm not, I'm not as valuable. Another one is like, no, I'm, I'm hoping to be the most valuable player is what I'm looking to do. And so we, we put each other in position. We do this all the time. So we enter back into this kind of a shame you know, an honor, shame kind of a culture. Consider this. I know uh, Brandon said they, they were in Asia, Southeast Asia. We don't say exactly where we're going for, for obvious reasons. There are some radicals there. Um, and it's, it's a dangerous thing to be a believer. But this is a place where, okay, you know, this is a vast region. Um, and a radical Hinduism, and you see this in these cultures. I've been to India and other places there where you have the caste system. You've heard of this, right? And I mean, literally, you talk to people, their whole identity is found in the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm low cast, I'm low caste. And I'm like, oh, that's who I am. They believe that. I'm in the lower caste. There's nothing I can do about it. Not in this life. I mean, I can try to be better and maybe I'll come, come back, you know, a little, little, little further along. Can you imagine that? Having that identity placed on you and yet many of us live that way. Many of us, we've talked about this self-condemnation that comes. Or those of us who maybe we do perform pretty well. Maybe you're in a position where you're like, I am the, the top dog. Or I am pretty good on my team. Or I do lead this team in my work. I don't feel devalued. But are you leveraging that position and, and all of that for the sake of the gospel? But again, this doesn't have to be vocational. Where are you among your friends? I mean, think with me here as you, as you apply this. In your family. Oh, I'm that person in my family, whether that's, you know, good or bad, up or down, right? I, I, you know, among, in your school, well, I'm kind of popular. I'm kind of not. He has more likes than me, got more friends. I, I'm not that person. See, we do it all the time, don't we? And the destructive thing about this, listen, the destructive thing about placing your worth in your position is, is this. All the time and effort we spend, some of you can relate to this, all the time and effort we spend to get that position, CEO, manager, you know, starting whatever, owner, pastor, how about this, husband, wife, married, um, parents, we think that we're going to become less vulnerable, but actually we become more vulnerable. Now you've got something to lose. If you're a parent, you worry about your kids all the time. Right? If you've climbed the ladder, you're worried about falling off the ladder. 
And uh, my experience tells me, I've been alive long enough, if you think your worth is found in being at the top on the ladder or in this position or that position, and you're not finding your identity in Christ, maybe you're seeking to, but if you're finding it in another place, uh, I'm going to warn you, the Lord loves you enough to say, I don't think so, I've got something better for you. And sometimes through some tragic events in our own lives, those things are stripped away. In fact, much of the sanctification process is the Lord taking away those things we have made idols, all for our good. Praise be to God. It's terrifying to go through, but on the backside of it, you say, yes, Lord, you're enough to understand that your value is found in him. We're more valuable than, than anything else in the collecting of trophies Finding our significance in, in those things, making a lot more money. I mean, how about this? If you don't think that someone you know, maybe it's you, with great resource, if you don't think you find your worth in, in your money, uh, then let's talk about your contentment and your joy, where you find it as you watch the stock market, right? As you watch it crash, or as you watch it, you know, over, over the, how about this past year or so, past couple of years, that, where does your worth and your value come from? How would you know? It's the book of Job. Have it taken away. That's how you, I'd, I'd argue you wouldn't know otherwise. Not really. And so if you're walking through this time, know that God is at work in your life. It was John Steinbeck who said this, it's, it's so much darker when the light goes out than it would have been if the light had never shone at all. And so you're probably thinking, well, Jeff, what do we do? Live like monks? I mean, you want us to go hide out? I mean, this is the world we live in. Um, No, but we certainly don't look at Pilate and Herod as our examples. We look at the one who's in chains on the floor. And I know that is a crazy thought. But watch this. Pilate and Herod are completely insecure, as are so many people that we see in leadership positions, even in our country today. And you know them, maybe in in your job. So insecure because of the reasons I've noted. Jesus is the one who's secure. So secure throughout this entire uh, trial, he says nothing because he doesn't need to. And the others are manipulating, trying to make it all happen. They're all anxious and worried, and Jesus is saying nothing. But here's what happens too. We can devalue Jesus when we do what they have done, what Pilate's doing. When we banish Jesus and send him off to another jurisdiction, how in the world do we do that? Think about it. Uh, Jesus, you can be part of my life right here. Like at church, let's talk about Jesus. Come on. Let me talk all about Jesus. And then you have friends, pockets of friends or family. They don't even know you're a believer. Like you have certain areas. Oh, he's Lord of my life here. Can I say it? I just want to challenge this. But uh, not, not, at, not in the club, not at, my, not at that, not there. Not uh, at the gym, not there. I'm not going to talk to anybody about Jesus there. Uh, I'm not, not in this, right? This arena of my life, this place. Where are you prone to dethrone Jesus as Lord of your life? As has been proclaimed this morning. Master, leader of your life. Where are you prone to do that? Because oftentimes we can compartmentalize. And friends, listen, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And we need to really be convicted by this. Let your light shine in all places. Don't play this chameleon game. It confuses everybody in your life. So you're worth more than your position. Look, secondly, you're worth more than your performance. All right, look at verse eight. When Herod uh, saw this or saw Jesus, he was very glad. For he had long desired to see him. So you may know this in Luke 9, 9, in our reading, Luke 9, 9, at the, really at the death of John the Baptist, Herod states he, he wants to meet this Jesus. Like, where is he? I've heard about him. He wants to meet. He's really happy. Oh, good. I get to meet him and then consider, you know, in his position now, Jesus, how he sees him. He wanted to see him for a long time because he'd heard about him. And he was hoping to see some sign done by him. Like he's, gonna, like he's a magician or something. He wants to see, well, show me something. So he questioned him at some length, and here it is. But he had no answer. Jesus did not respond to him. Again, I picture him on the floor in chains, hardly able to speak. But Herod is intrigued by Jesus, but he completely misses the point. Totally disvalues, devalues him. This is that time of the year, gang, I've already seen it. You'll be at the grocery line uh, or on TV. There'll be a special about Jesus. 
Like you'll see Jesus' face on a magazine. Like, like the person of you know, the millennium. The person of all, all history. He's his face on a cover. The, his, the historical Jesus. You know, something about him. And most often where these shows, where, you know, National Geographic, History Channel. Most often it runs to, man, he was a great teacher. He established the world's, you know, biggest religion. And as C.S. Lewis has noted, Jesus did not give us that option. Uh, he was either Lord of all, or he was a lunatic. He's crazy. Or he's a liar. Now, we, we've talked about that much. But Jesus is who he says he is, but he's not the kind of, of Messiah that any of us anticipated. Certainly they didn't. They want, Herod wants Jesus to entertain him and we are prone to do the same. I want Jesus to be kind of my spiritual concierge. Like when I need him, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to him. When I'm desperate, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to him. But, but listen, here's the thing that I want you to see. Many of us want Jesus to show us some, some kind of sign or wonder. Uh, we want him to entertain us. And, and he, he's not treated as the valuable, most valuable Messiah that he is. But we too, we do the same. We judge people based on what they can bring into our lives. That's what Herod's doing. Entertain me. Be my, you know, be my, my little, little play thing. But we do this with people. We, we, you know, we, we, we live with, with certain people who might, how about this? You might feel that you're one who's degraded like that because there's a lot of Herods out there. You might live with one. You may know, you may work with one. Just, you know, you're here for me. You're here to entertain me. You're here to take care of my, my things. You, you're, and this can get real tender for some of us because maybe, maybe you're the one you feel put upon. Maybe you feel neglected. Maybe you feel devalued, even abused. But listen, I want you to hear this. You are so much more than somebody's plaything. You are worth everything to Jesus. And that's where your worth comes from. You are nobody's entertainer. And you are nobody's plaything. You are created in the image of God. And, and, and this is why we don't look to Herod and to Pilate. We look at the one who is on trial, the one with ultimate authority, because he's taking all that on himself for you. And in so doing, he's saying, you are valued above all things. I value with everything. I value with my own life. And, and it's not based on what you can offer him. Because some of us, we think that we must entertain God somehow. If I do certain things, pull certain levers, hit the right buttons, like he's an Amazon man, I'm going to, Lord, if I do this, then you'll do this for me. Some of us enter into our relationship with God that way. And what, all we need to do, though, instead is to come to him and say, Lord, I've got nothing to bring to you. And he goes, I know that. And so I, I've got nothing. I know that. That's why I'm your substitute. That's why I'm bringing everything for you. You bring nothing to the table in regard to your salvation, but your sin. That's it. And Jesus says, that's all I want. Because see, and, and here's, what, here's how it flips. We're the ones in chains. And Jesus took on our chains so that we could be set free. But, but I want to say this. So, so you're now in the court of the king, the, one, the only one who matters. But if you are a Herod, and if some of us are honest enough here, if you see the world, your worldview is everybody exists for you. And that's where you are. Added value, diminished value into your own life. I've got a word for you as well. In fact, the Lord Jesus has a word for you. If you're like Herod, if you're an abuser, a user, a person who uses people in your vocation or relationships or dating life, you toss them aside after you're done with them. Then the world, listen, history will say of you what it says of Herod and Pilate and others. In fact, a lot of commentators wonder, why is this part of the story even in here? Herod brings nothing to the table. He doesn't pro, you know, progress this, this trial along at all, even in his position. Because that's what happens with people who, who, who must be entertained, who must be served, who must be coddled. They bring nothing to other people. They do not progress humanity and the advancement, certainly, of the kingdom of God in any way at all. And so the sad thing is that even people like that think that Jesus can't bring anything to them. 
This is where Herod is, where Pilate is. It's where anybody who may be here today, you, you're, you're questioning whether Jesus brings any value to your life. And friends, I'm telling you, he brings the greatest value of all. And if you don't have Christ as your number one value, and he sets every other, seek first the kingdom, king and his kingdom, everything else will fall into place. Then your whole, if you don't have the king who's guiding your value system, then your entire value system is whacked, out of whack. And it's no wonder that you're seeking worth and value through your position, through your performance. Uh, instead, Jesus comes and says, no, 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 uh, I love you. And watch this, Jesus is not here to entertain you. He's here to love you and to guide you. He's here to save you. Look at verse 10. The chief priest and the, and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt. There's the word. And mocked him, that contempt, devalued him, discredited him, him mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, probably one of Herod's, Herod's robes, likely, he sent him back to Pilate. They're just making fun of him. Because Jesus is not going to be your genie in a bottle. He's not going to be your spiritual assistant, your concierge doing whatever you want him to do. How do we fight against this kind of life? Because we all struggle with this. In fact, we lose our prayer life often. Lord, I prayed this and you didn't do this thing. You know, I thought you were here to serve me somehow. <laughs> Instead of us serving him, prayer becomes, Lord, help me to just align with your will. That's what I want to do. Your kingdom come in my life. Not my will be done. Yours be done, which is the prayer of Jesus in the garden, of course. How do we fight against this? You do it in community. You do it in common unity with other brothers and sisters. That's how you do it. See, here, watch this. This is so important. A call to Christ is a call to one another. A call to Christ is a call to each other. We now love each other, other believers. We commit ourselves to other believers. And yes, others in our lives, everybody in the world. But a call to him is a call to his church, which is why many of you today, if you're not yet a member, you need to join the church today. I mean, could I say it boldly? You need to do it today. If you've not been baptized like Clark, you need to step forward and do it. And, and say, I belong to this local body of believers. Otherwise, we come into worship, come into a church, and we all, we're all prone to do this. And we become consumers. Just watch your conversation on the way home. How was church? Eh, you know, eh, pretty good sermon. I mean, it went a little long, I think. I don't know. He's always going long. I don't know what he's doing. Um, I had music, not so much. No, watch this. How was worship? Did you? I mean, I don't know. You tell me. The answer to that question should be, man, I was, I was, I was pouring my heart out to him. Because I, I came here to worship him. And I was, it was so fun to see that person and that person. I was just, and I wanted to love people well. Do you come here to serve or to consume? If you're a consumer, you become a critic. Consumers are critics. And we come to worship the one who's given himself to us. I, I wanna, I, you know, a lot of people look for signs and wonders. I want you to show you a sign. I've got a picture of this, this gal that Brandon referenced earlier um, somewhere off in Southeast Asia. And uh, this woman in the middle... Um, is she there? No, she's not. There she is. Um, this little woman in the middle is the one he's talking about, a believer in this village, the lone believer until the other day when others are now coming to Christ and we start to see this unfold. And now there's going to be a church planted in this place. I'm, I'm, t I'm showing her because listen, this is a miracle. You look for miracles, signs and wonders, God, entertain me, show me something. Every single life, one life at a time, is a miracle. In fact, Jesus said um, in Mark 8, 15, he said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and, the, and Herod. Be, and what he's saying is the leaven is this idea that earthly power, political power, elections, leaders are how the, the, the kingdom is going to advance. And Jesus told us as his disciples, that's not how my kingdom advances. How does it advance? One person at a time, that little woman on her knees out in Southeast Asia is a hero in the kingdom. And you and I may never meet her, not know her, her name, but in the kingdom of God, she is here. And many that we claim are leaders and influencers are here. Because that's the way the kingdom rolls. Listen, you're not defined by your position. 
You're worth more than your performance. Finally, we'll close here. You're worth more than your plans. And, and, and what I mean here, you're worth more than your checklist. You're worth more than your agendas. You're worth more than what you've, uh, your hopes or desires if they're not aligned with Jesus. Watch this, verse 12. It ends, it ends with an interesting epitaph of this story. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that day, that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. How about that? These guys were enemies, now they're besties because they have a common enemy. Their, 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 their plans, all, everyone here, their agendas have coalesced to get rid of Jesus, their animosity toward Jesus. And this happens a lot, right? Their animosity towards others has pulled us together. We see, we see this in, in spades in the political kind of climate we're in right now, right? Because these men, here's, what, here's what's happening. They believed that power is lo, ultimately located in earthly strength, earthly power, earthly influence, thinking that the weapons of this world are how they're going to advance change in the culture. And many of us think the same. Because here's what's happening. A lot of Christians, the, the, primarily the, the place we run, and I'm seeing this a lot in our day, praise be to God, not so much here, where people align or co-opted by worldly powers. So it becomes, you know, Christians become a, a, a voting block, a political group. And that's not who we are. Those things matter. And it matter, our, and our, our, all that, all, all that stuff matters. Those big agendas, though, that we attach ourselves to, you better be certain that they are about the kingdom of God to bring cultural change. And then here's the thing, though. Our smaller agendas are how we, um, how we live our lives every day. Like, like, you know, your plans and we become human doings as opposed to being human beings, right? Is how we say it. Because here's the thing. We confuse our agendas. We confuse our plans with purpose. Watch this. Just because you're busy doesn't mean you're important. Oftentimes, you're busy because you're distracted. That's what you are. Busy people aren't necessarily important people. People of influence or people who are living a life of purpose. Oftentimes, busy people are distracted and are not truly focused on the king and his kingdom. And listen, friends, in him, we finally find rest. When we join, align our plans with him daily with his plans, not our own plans, but his. As we're seeking to love others and serve him, let him be our king. And then we find rest. That is a life of rest and purpose. That, that's like Jesus. He's silent. Don't need to say a word. I'm right at the center of the will of God. You are more than your position. You're more than your performance, and you're more than your plans. And Paul says it like this. Watch this. To me, though I'm, at the, I'm the very least of all the saints, the grace, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches. Here it is. Watch this. The most valuable one in the universe. Boundless riches is another. Immeasurable riches is another translation. The immeasurable riches of Christ, the most valued one of all, invites us to come in. He extends his grace to us and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God. What is this plan that's been hidden for ages? It's the gospel. Jesus took your sin upon the cross. Yes, he suffered for you so that you wouldn't have to. He was devalued completely all the way to death so that you would be valued You'd be raised up and you would find your worth and your value in him. This is the boundless gospel. So what is the cost of a human life? What is it? Well, think about this. If you're to sell your house and you say, I'm going to sell this house for a million dollars. And your real estate you know, agent said, no, it's about worth a hundred thousand. Um, you go, no, I'm like for real. It's, it, it's called the endowment effect. It's where the owner or the seller thinks the thing is much more valuable than it is because they love it so much, Right? Well, but but here's, here's, the, here's the thing. Your, your, your house is worth, or anything else you have, as much as anyone might pay for it. That's what it's worth. Somebody's going to buy it for $100,000. That's what it's worth, right? In the same way, grace, there's this built-in endowment effect where, where Jesus says, I own you. I've created you. And now I'm going to buy you back because you're worth my life is what you're worth. That's what I'm going to pay for you. It's why it says in 1 Corinthians 6, and we'll close with this. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? If you've received Christ, his spirit lives in you. This is the location of the presence of God in your life. 
And where else do you live your life but in your body, right? It's within you. Whom you have from God, you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Friends, he created you to serve him. He bought you with his own blood. So how will you respond? Jesus said, the kingdom is like a man who went out and found uh, fine pearls. He sold everything he had to purchase them. It's like a man who found a treasure in a field. And he went out and sold all that he had to go buy the field. So he, it, Jesus is saying, listen, I am worth, the kingdom is worth everything you've got. And that's the challenge for us today. Will you do so? Will you give your life to him and find your ultimate value in him? And those of you who know him, live in him this week. Let's pray together as we close. Lord, thank you for this incredible truth. Thank you for the reality that you were devalued so that we might be valued above everything. We're, we're more sinful than we can imagine again, but we are more loved than we've ever dreamed. And we are more valuable to you than we even know today. So Lord, I pray that every one of us will leave knowing how much you love us. And I pray for those who don't know you today. And, and maybe you're here today, you're wrestling or, or listening online or sometime later on. Do you know him? Have you given your life to him? He has died for you. The most valuable one gave his life for you so that you would be valued forever, not based on your position, your possessions, not based on your performance or your own plans but what he has for you. And so, Lord, we give you our lives. We give everything to you because you are worthy of it all. It's in your name we pray. Amen.